about your creative vision? You know, have you found yourself, because it sounds like you're constantly adapting to, to the environment, shooting on manual and just going with the flow, almost in a journalistic way telling stories. Have you found a certain style that you think you have? Um, is there a style that you're going for? How do you describe your style? I, I, I think maybe style goes towards whatever mood I guess I'm in. I tend to shoot wide a lot of times, but I, I really appreciate the, the up close nature of, of moments. And so like, like these photos you're showing now, this is actually during one of the downriver races, somebody got their raft trapped and uh, not a lot, there's not a lot of photos of these types of rescue, which is really cool too. So that this, this system enabled this, the capturing of this moment, and and it, it's quite dangerous within here. And uh, Jeremy Stump is, uh, is actually the guy like underwater right there. You can see his head poking through. Like, well, that's like a horrible entrapment scenario. Um, uh -huh. But but he's extremely skillful. And so like you know, I'm I'm hanging around with a lot of skilled people. I am not uh, you know a skilled boater like these guys are. And so I mean, I'm trying. No, your style. You know, I wanted to you oh, yeah. talk about shooting wide, uh, yeah. and and I can definitely tell, and I think that that goes to the intimacy that you're trying to create in the storytelling. You know, the 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 people in the photos or the story that you're trying to tell. Uh, that that intimacy comes through with the lenses that it, it looks like you're using mostly. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering if there are other elements to the images that you think of as something that's a stylistic decision. Mm, uh, yeah, color and light, you know, those are kind of the standard standard things, right? Um, it's, it's more like capturing, capturing people in those blissful moments that like they don't realize I'm there. That That's the only style that I think I can lean on that appears pretty you know, that, that to me that I want to capture. It's, it's I don't like posing things. It's just that, that always just feels false and, and try to sneak up when I can and and let these people kind of create these moments for me. So the style is just leaning on on my friends and, and the individuals in the photos and and the rest just kind of takes care of itself. I like to shoot towards the light a lot. Uh, one of my favorite things is to shoot kind of directly towards the sun. I mean, maybe at a right angle at times, but I really enjoy the kind of dramatic effect. So if there's any style there, it's that I do like, especially underwater, uh, the, the rays really uh, accentuate quite well when you shoot directly towards the, the light. Yeah, you can get a, a lot of um, layers almost in some of these pictures. Um, I encourage people to, to send questions. We are getting some. So we got a question from Mark as to depth of field. What's your stance of, on depth of field with your images and how is your story dictated from it or vice versa? That's a great question because I, I had a two. I had a. I actually had a kind of a swing on that in the last few years. I used to shoot really. If you, uh, if you look at the data, I used to shoot really uh, shallow depth of field for for a while, uh, below aperture settings uh, as much as possible because I really liked that kind of the bokeh you know effect and everything. And and then uh, I uh, I took a class. I got a grant to a class from Jason Houston. He's an amazing conservation photographer and and he taught me some things in the photojournalistic side of things. Is you want to shoot as 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 kind of open as possible you are or not open um, as tight you want you want your you want a larger depth of field because it's all about that story and capturing as much content as possible if, you, if you're losing um detail uh then, then you're losing the story and so even if you have to jack the iso up a little grainy 14 or, or whatever whatever you need you know, still you still want to capture things that are artistic and fun but if you're going for the story uh Higher, higher aperture settings are, are highly recommended in that. But uh, but underwater, so underwater, that actually a lot of that goes out the window because you need higher, higher apertures in order to actually get anything in focus because the, um, the focus still drops, especially with the dome, the dome port. The dome ports create a virtual, a virtual, like well, depending on the the curvature, it's all like nine out. and. Um, so that's what you're focusing. At. You're not focusing at anything else. You're not focusing at whatever distance you think. You're focusing at a virtual way to project it out from your from your lens. And so uh, that's something I learned immediately. I tried putting a 24, uh, 14, 24, 70 underwater. I couldn't get anything in focus because I couldn't focus shallow enough to capture that virtual image. And mm -hmm. for some of like the things that you know, getting into underwater, it was like hard to learn. And so I'll I'll jack up the ISO settings underwater to get um, a larger depth of field 
uh, because of how shallow it becomes. So if you're shooting a 2.8 or f4 out here, I mean, it just goes like you've got a sliver of what's in focus uh, once you go underwater. And also with underwater, you know, light diminishes rapidly, especially the red spectrum. So um, you really have to really have to account for that. So you don't want to have to jack your ice up. You can't because you want as much uh, light quality as you can. So in post, you can bring bring light back to it without degrading the well, I, I was wanting to shift gears a little bit on video and I forgive the audio on my end because we've got you know things going on that we can't control outside. But um, I wanted to shift gears a little bit to talk about video. I think you've got an award-winning short on um, a specific type of kayaking. And I was wondering how your transition to video happened, if you were already toying with video before and it was kind of a conscious move. How, how did that happen? No, I was kind of pushed there. Um, so Jim Snyder, he's, he's, like, he's kind of like my, my river mentor with, with these things. and. Uh, so I was out, my sister got me a GoPro and I, I kind of written those things off a long time ago because the image quality to me wasn't worth the time. And, but I also didn't have an underwater housing. So I was swimming at this place called Bassing Valley, which you'll see in the video. And, and I started playing with this GoPro and taking photos of Jim one day and then, and then really fun, got some great imagery. And then the second time I was like, you know what? You should take some video. It's like, we, 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 we like, when he says we, he was talking about the, the sport boating community. We really like, they like to see how long they're underwater. You know, it's like tracking that like that drop that chart you know they go down and they follow this path through the water and and so what they're doing is they're riding a secondary and tertiary flows that then drive underneath the primary slab and, and so they're riding and so in this particular boat is actually a prototype uh it's a sled prototype an open open top normally they're actually as a low volume haul that will will bring them back up eventually this is low water in this particular uh, video, and so there's the risk is much lower uh, as far as drowning is concerned. Um, it sounds but, dangerous. It is. No, I'm, I'm, I can, you've got rocks everywhere. You've got the river current. Yeah, you got boats flying at you. So I'm trying to, yeah. and that's another thing is that you know, they're not used to people being in the water with them because they're like a spinning blade, and so like uh, like that moment right there, like I swung around underneath of the of the boat. Um, but, uh, but so it's taken, taken a lot of time to kind of earn that, that, their confidence in me being down there with them to not get in their way and affect their, their chark as they're going down through there. And by chark, they, they call this this term of their charging arc, it's this path that the boat follows as it, as it enters the, the slipstream. And, and uh, it's kind of like bait, I guess, you know, it's, it's kind of like that. They got a handshake where the water grabs you. And it's actually fun to watch people struggle to get underwater, like it, it, it's once, you, once it finally accepts you, then you've got it, but it, it's, uh, it's kind of fun. Um, are, are you shooting professionally for publications, all of the above? I guess maybe somewhere all of the above. I'm trying to balance all of those things. Uh, you know, professionally, I, I'm in, in, I do it you know, hearing, so it's hard to, to just take time off to, to go to these events when they have them. They have them all over the world, and I'm hoping in the, you know, in the, in the not too distant future, I can start attending a few of these uh, larger gatherings and sport boat gatherings uh, last year or 2018 uh, traveled to Japan uh, with Jim and uh, a few others um, to, to participate in the world championship of sport boating uh, in, in Japan and that was a glorious time and so that that's one of the events I've traveled to I, there was I just I was just in two articles recently one with uh, Highland Outdoors um, check them out great magazine um, and, and also Blue Ridge Outdoors, where they did interviews with, with Jim Snyder and Joel and, and, and Jim here. And I was the uh, photographer of those, of those people, so I, I was interviewed. And, and some of the things they, 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 they actually asked me questions about, you know, how I, how I get these photos, and I've got, got some advice for that when we get to that point. How did squirt boating, you know, originally? Was Jim the sort of the yeah, the forefather of it. He kind of created it out of kayaking. What was he after? Something lighter? Was he literally trying to get under? Was it a combination of swimming and kayaking? What, what, what was the evolution? I, I imagine you've talked to him about it. Yeah, well, yeah, I've talked to him a bit. Yeah, you rarely see him out of the kayak, so definitely not swimming, I don't think. Uh, but he, he's a play. He's a playboater at heart. So this is just like if you can take. You, maybe, maybe I actually didn't know him back in the 70s. I was born in 1983, but you know, he 
he was running some of the hardest stuff back then, and he started doing like en like cartwheels and endos, and all these I don't know terms, right? But all these tricks in these boats. Oh, and this this moment is really cool because I mean, a storm came up and the waters like rose on us in a moment. But this is one of my favorites as catching that rain and then the bubbles coming up simultaneously. It's this peaceful, meditative thing, and it really is. Like that's why I. So what I do is this stuff right here. Like this is the end of the video. I like to climb underwater. That to me is a very peaceful, meditative thing to do, and just. Kind of just campusing around on the rocks underwater is to me my that's my favorite thing to go do for fun and and there really isn't a lot of other things that i'd rather go do and he created a whole sport centered around what he wanted to do and a lot of people followed suit because it's that awesome but it's still it's like a niche within a niche within a niche it's like this very obscure thing and here's another thing with that particular sport there's only certain places that that, that this can be done and they call these uh areas mystery spots and, and, and because there's the mystery move is what you have to do to get down. And so these, these photos were actually taken, this, this is kind of fun, uh, during the, uh, the eclipse, and we had the solar eclipse, and I figured there'd be a lot of people out taking photos of that. And so I thought it'd be really fun to try to eclipse the eclipse. And so in one of these photos, I've got Jim actually going across the, the, the sun as it, during, during the eclipse hour. So you really can't tell if the eclipse though, it's just kind of like, that That is super cool. It was, yeah. So. Yeah, the colors, I, I'm imagining that there's not a lot of post-production to this, right? These are the actual colors. Oh, no, this, colors. So there, this is, this one's pretty, this, I did bring a red filter down on this one to bring it back. So it balanced, it balanced the low light, right? So you can see how the low light is, is or mid, mid, mid range there is about correct. But, you know, I didn't rebalance the top. I just liked how it looked. So, um, so I had to bring red down in to, to, to get the hues right, but then you have to do another layer to cancel that out. I just happen to really like how that image looked um, with trying to balance the red. And that's why you shoot. And so this, now this one on the other hand uh, is less, this one is actually, I mean, the water, we get a lot of water from, I think it's a black water or you know, watershed. So uh, there's a lot of tannins that will arrive in the water sometimes and it will have this amber, amber uh, tint to it. And, uh, and, and on another publication I want to me mention that really kind of like, Kind of help uh, help me uh, get a name in, in the sport of sport boating. I suppose is, is uh, Kayak Session Magazine. They actually ran a whole portfolio on Jim and my work, and, uh, and that was really pretty wild. I've never I hadn't had a large feature in a magazine like that. So. What advice do you have for people that want to get into uh, some you know water, river, uh, kayaking type? photography, lessons that you've learned over the years, both in terms of gear, technique, what to use, what to bring. So ha having having a good set of goggles, uh, I really, really enjoy these. Real low profile little thing here. Uh, uh -huh. So you can well, get close to the camera? Yeah, well, it's also just like, so, so that you're not losing them when the current hits you. So it's like, these are really tight, nice, nice and low profile, so there's not a lot of air and, and drag from them. So I really enjoy those. They also look like Batman. Um, that I, so that's uh, I think that has been great, um, especially for diving deep. So when I'm not doing underwater uh, squirt boat photography, I like to like to travel a bit, and we've done some some trips to Mexico and Hawaii, and I like to, to you know dive deep, um, free dive. And in the last, how long can you hold your breath? I, I've seen some of these video clips that I've lost track even in the video clip how, how long you're under. So that, that's the, it's kind of the ace in the hole for me is that I can hold my breath longer than they're down. So I go down about 10, 10 seconds or so before they do set up, post up, and then I make sure I come up after them. I go down for like two minutes, two minutes plus sometimes um, if I need to. Um, I'd like to get to five minutes sometime. It's very, very achievable. Um, one of the things that's really been nice for that is this this watch. I got a, a dive watch. Uh, a friend I met in Mexico, Alessandro, had, had one of these. and. Uh, and, and this, this tells me how deep I am and how long I've been down. So I can have set, the, set, set an alarm for 30 seconds. So I've got these little markers of how long I've been down because you, you don't want to injure yourself. Preference for different conditions or do you feel like most of the cameras now are capable of handling what you what you need? Yeah, I think I think most cameras can handle what you need as long as you're familiar with the camera. Sure, you're going to water requires a, like a fine knowledge of your camera because uh, it's not You'll, you'll shoot everything wrong. I, I've, I've gone under several times for like an hour, hour plus, couple hours, and come back and look at the footage. It's all out of focus. Some, some amazing thing. And mm -hmm. that's taught me some lessons about how to all, repeatedly check focus. I repeatedly check focus. Every time I go into water, I'll have, like right before it, I'll make sure I go down and check focus, come up, verify an image, and then go back down and, and 
because it's so easy to, to, to lose, lose focus on water. That's one thing. I mean, you know, having having a, a, a solid solid underwater housing that can handle what you what you need. That's another thing. So I mean, in fact, I'm 100 mm -hmm. committed to the underwater Valtex line. It's done everything I need and and more, and it's full and lightweight. And um, you know, you know, I don't know what the are you guys working on anything that can handle deeper conditions. Uh, you know, I know that's more of you need a rigid body for that, but uh, I think I've taken years down to around 40 feet before and that's not to be advised it is not yeah we get that question a lot and actually the, the altex housing doesn't care how deep yeah. you go in a, in a way but it doesn't protect your camera against the pressure so what happens we, we rate it for 10 meters or about 35 feet but you can actually control that by how much trapped air you allow inside and so after a certain depth what happens is the pressure will start pressing against the buttons and will press the, the camera buttons to a point where the camera just becomes unusable. Gotcha. And so depending on how much air you've left trapped in and how, depending on how deep you go and the functions that you're trying to access vary, but obviously it's not designed to go scuba diving, but you can use it like you've shown in depths that exceed 10 meters it's just that you know we we don't claim that to be the case right right well, that's cool um, but i i wanted to dive i guess pun intended into the um the conditions because obviously you're you're in great shape you can hold your breath and when you're kayaking you're with other experts uh, do you consult with locals when you go you know i've seen lots of pictures in hawaii i've seen some pictures in the cenotes in mexico um, what's your advice for scoping out locations? Uh, you know, do you do research in advance? Do you go with people that know? Oh, yeah. So sometimes you know, we go with people, you know, in Hawaii, we, we have a friend in Hawaii. So they, they took us to a lot of spots and that was pretty wonderful. Um, Mexico, um, been going there for a few years and that's just been trial and error. You, you just kind of have to go. You can look what other people are doing, but the other problem with that is is that these areas, these cenotes are becoming more and more popular. So it's kind of trying to find the ones that are off the beaten path and are less known about. And, and a lot of heavy Google searching, Google map searching. In fact, one of my favorite spots um, is this, uh, um, this snorkeling spot was actually right in front of the place where we were staying in Plato Carmen. It was like, uh, quarter mile offshore and you can see it on the satellite imagery but but you don't you don't it's not marked as a as a, as a mm -hmm. tour spot um mm -hmm. so that's I, I just like i'm gonna try to swim up there and i did it was just fabulous i mean wonderful wonderful coral and so it's just trial and error largely and i think that's some of the, the fun of it is is uh the adventure of having some bad days so that you can have some good days and if you, if you can't have all good days out there you know, there's plenty of times i'll show up to the river and it's just you know, the turbidity is too high and, and, and this is john bell in that photo that's another like matt he's like a master uh sport boater i think he's he did what, what he, uh, him is capable of so uh he's one of those those people taking the sport to a new level that new level so obviously um th the situation we're in is a little different but what are you excited about next? What are some of the projects that you're working on, or things that are upcoming that you're that you're excited about? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, well, I was supposed to be in China uh, in, uh, in February, March. For that so that uh, hoping that comes back around. Um, I was going to travel with my friend Jamie Lester, who's a, who's a professional sculptor, and we were, I was going to help photo document his process. And, uh, that was going to be pretty fun. So looking forward to that when that comes back around. That's supposed to be in Hawaii uh, next month. That got canceled. Uh, so, so I don't know what I'm looking for right now. I guess maybe looking forward to spending a lot of time around uh, around here, you know, on the cheap canyon. So this might be a, a you know, very cheap centric summer for me, um, as it often is, but really getting to explore some of it. There's, there's like caves um, that, in fact, the optics system would work extremely well in these caving situations. So there's there's all sorts of things that uh, I'm looking forward to here, but it's all pretty local. Nice outside, you know, it's nice outside. So I want to invite before we wrap up, I want to invite everybody to uh, send in questions. So if you have questions for Gabe, send them our way. 
Um, I was wondering about safety because obviously, like I said earlier, you're a safe swimmer, you know, a conditioned swimmer. You know a lot of the rivers close to where you are, but I envision that safety, you know, it, it is tricky in that when you've got competitors coming in from out of town, they're competing in environments that they don't know. I also envision that conditions change, right? When there's a lot of rain off, um, you know, the river can be dramatically different than when it's calm and not rainy. Um, what are the safety issues and, and how should people prepare or, or get informed about conditions with kayaking and photography like that? I don't know how to advise on, on safe photography with kayaking. That, that's a hard thing, but for safe kayaking, there's a website, uh, American Whitewater uh, website that um, actually tells you the different levels and and uh, and of the of the current stream conditions. So there's gauges all over the, all the United States, and then those are feeding this website, and it'll tell you the runnable levels and the difficulty at those levels. So that's that's a good resource for looking uh, for river safety. Um, taking a swift water rescue class would be advisable. In fact, um, I. My, while my partner was taking a swift water rescue class and I tried to get in it, but it was cool. I went boating and, and at that time I was not feeling um, overly confident. And that's another piece of advice maybe is to, to overconfidence is it will get you killed. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When water sports, you know, that's not like climbing where you can try to do something harder than you can try to climb this like 512 sport climb and fail repeatedly and not have to push yourself. Whereas there's, there's not a lot of room because you can breathe. When you fall, you can still breathe. Right. And, Boating, you fall. The odds, uh, especially in like you know class five whitewater, I mean, it's just it hits the fan. And uh, you know I've seen some situations that just aren't fun to be around when that happens. And so um, yeah, I've taken some real bad climbing falls, but none of them are. So I went while my partner was taking that swift water rescue. I uh, I ended up ripping my shoulder out of socket uh, trying to roll a boat that was uh, that I was interested. I you know just getting out. Just getting out, you know, that's the biggest thing. And you're not letting you know, the your your personal momentum is the, is the only thing that's going to like stop you. So if you're at rest, you're going to stay at rest. So the moment you start moving, you're in a continual motion forward. So no matter what you're doing, is if you're, if you're doing something, then you're progressing. So mm -hmm. uh, don't don't uh, rock back on your heels too much. I mean, I've actually I've actually done a little bit of that, but it's opened up another space in my life. So like uh, I follow some. I used to I've got the photography data. You can where it drops off um but i used to photograph kind of everything bring my camera everywhere and i have all this uh, photo debt of people and friends that i need to get to if i can behind but um i read i read a post from somebody that i kind of like have been following and it threw me off a little bit and said so many problems with photographers shooting outside their their niche and, and like what they wonder what they're good at and i at that time i was considering myself i really like water so then maybe that's what i'm good at and it kind of stopped me from shooting everything else. Like I stopped taking photos of, of things that weren't water-based and not necessarily by choice, but just I kind of lost the inspiration. And it, sometimes it's a shame when you read something like that that has such an effect on you. But at the same time, it didn't, that, that space didn't go unfilled. I immediately filled it with, uh, with learning more about these data science softwares. I started taking Python classes and have, have since gained more insight into, into like this data science realm. And that mm -hmm. is, changed my life significantly so you know I mean, good luck bad luck you know i don't know if, it, you know, if it's good that i started taking more photos in water or less you know, or, or stop taking more or less photos uh, around but i think it's also allowed me to kind of appreciate moments uh my partner tara always would get on me for uh not being present because i'm phot photographing for me that was being present mm -hmm. so kind of a it's kind of a different view of it but i, I respect what she's saying and, and sometimes you just got to be there and observing it so that's in the last like two three years i've been a lot more present at that function instead of behind the lens but what i'm doing in those moments is capturing the happiness of people and that makes me happy so that you know i, I still all the time in the minimal moment i'm like man I really wish I but then i go back to man when am i going to find time to edit those photos and so then that that puts me back in my place of like ah i'll just i'll just enjoy this moment and not worry about it worry about that i think my friends are some of the most inspirational people for me in my life because that's 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 more you know uh, tangible um you know so like people like, so, like amazing photographers just like at it consistently in fact there's like these two guys that just don't stop one of them is this guy justin harris he's he's like a true like you know white water photographer this guy's getting out there all the time 
and and it, I love watching this stuff because it just it makes me want to go outside. And um, and then and then this actual Woolport just has a, a storytelling mode that you know, pretty pretty niche, in, and I try to emulate that whenever I. Can. In fact, that's the type of question I'll, I'll ask myself while I'm out, uh, and then I have a whole you know people in my mind for this. Is that you know how would how would so and so have captured it? How would how would they render this moment? Especially if I'm looking for internal inspiration that this isn't there, I'll uh, I'll go to like well I've seen my friend shoot something from this angle. Let me try that, and then and then that adds adds to that moment and, and uh, makes some you often make something very unique and pretty. And, and this image right here, uh, I like that because that's kind of what I do at the day job. It's just it's just bring me a rock. If people people come with questions on. Yeah, I have this need, and I don't know exactly what I need to fill with. But can you help? And and that's it. So like, Joel took a photo of me uh, with that. Yeah, that that's one of my favorite pictures of you. When when I think of you, um, I think of that shot, and I also think of your shot on a kayak. Um, I think it's your bio photo on our Altex Ambassador page, uh, where you're literally on a kayak holding the camera with your helmet on. And so those are the, the two states that I think of you, you know, either above water on a kayak or underwater uh, collecting rocks or, or studying data. Right on. <laughs> well, Gabe, uh, always a pleasure seeing you. Um, really enjoyed having you on. Good to see you doing well. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time and sharing some of your experiences, some of your work with us. And uh, we'll, we'll have to do it again more often. Hopefully things will resume to, to some sense of normalcy so that we can get together again. You know, it's nice seeing you at, at events here and there. And uh, hopefully we'll be doing a lot more of that. Yeah, thanks for having me in New York, by the way. That was so random. I really appreciated that. You know, I just saw there was this, this awesome photo event. And, hey, Altex is there. I see you got posting this. Like, I'm down the street. Like, can I come and say hi? You're like, yeah, absolutely. Come on in. And I, I'd like to do that again. I think that would be a lot of fun. I mean, the people there were stoked and, and the stories that you guys were telling and the people that were stoked about the equipment because it was so unique compared to everything else that was there. You know, you've got a really unique product and I think that it's going to go far. So you know, keep at it. Man. Keep Appreciate that. Yeah, like you, we're always looking to learn and expand and just be creative and, and not let, you know, one thing stop us, but, but always looking to problem solve and, and be creative. So thanks again. Stay well and hopefully we'll see you soon. Yeah. Bye-bye.